Rory, welcome to the show. I'm really pleased to have you. Um, how have you been coping in these really unusual times? Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's 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 been okay. It's, I say they are strange times, but I'm in the final stages of my PhD, so writing up. So I'm spending most of my day sitting in the office, just typing away. So not really been going out very much anyway. So not noticed it too much. So uh, so you're you're finishing up. Was it four years or five years? Uh, four years with the CDT. Um, so we basically do the first year six months worth of sort of training like a master's um, and then we do a small project and then in our second year we officially start our PhD and do the three years as normal for a PhD. Excellent so uh, uh, your research is really um, interesting in that you are looking at cyber security um, with regards to the sort of shipping and maritime industry so before we get into the research I want to know what was sort of drove you in that direction so as part of my masters um that i did at royal holloway um my uh, lecturer at the time now my supervisor uh takes us organizes a trip and takes us up to london to the international maritime organization mm -hmm. which is the un uh, body in charge with creating international shipping regulations um so obviously we're lucky enough to go up see the work they do there. And at the time when I was doing my master's, they were just uh, starting to introduce um, new regulations on shipping in polar waters. And this sort of caught my eye of, you know, an interesting kind of way of dealing with a sort of fragile environment. And that sort of hooked my interest in maritime regulation and governance and then got offered a place in the CDT. So had to sort of think, well, actually, maybe I should start looking at cybersecurity now found that there was limited work being done um, and obviously it was an exciting field at the same time so I thought I might as well carry on doing that then. Yeah I mean it does seem like a, a really exciting field and you've you've written an article with um, uh, Keith on on this um, really interesting field that I'll sort of link on the show and, and I urge audiences to sort of take a look at because it's a really um, self-explanatory article I mean you don't need to do any more research on it. Um, but talk us through the the difficulties of the maritime industry. Why is cybersecurity so um, you know so sort of uh, such a new thing there? So there's quite a lot of challenges um, that sort of face the industry and regulators for maritime cybersecurity. Um, I mean, you just have to look at sort of the different number of ships there are, the different operations they're doing, the different environments they operate in, the different types of crew they have on board. You know, there's so many different elements and factors there that need, you know, that each different company will prioritise. And the different systems and things, you know, just creates quite a complex sort of landscape for regulators to understand. I mean, there's a lot of similar systems on board, like navigation systems, the GPS systems, obviously, um, and some of the communication systems. So there are some similarities, but the way that those are then interlinked with the other systems makes it quite difficult to understand, you know, every ship individually. Um, and also there's a lot of older legacy systems, so what we would call legacy systems. So these systems were built and designed maybe 20 years ago and because ships are designed to last for 20 plus years mm -hmm. these systems are still in use now and when they were first installed they might have already been some of those components and hardware might have already been five or six years out of date at that point so you can see how over time these systems are actually starting to become more and more outdated and there's quite a large market for second-hand ships as well so as a company mm -hmm. say Maersk who've got several hundred ships they, when those ships start hitting the end of their life, they'll often sell them on to other companies. And those companies will then, you know, get another 10 years of use out of them. So again, these systems are constantly, you know, mm -hmm. falling more and more out of date. And as you've seen, you know, how many new iPhones we had in the last what, five, six years, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same with ships, you know, these systems are getting outdated. They're no longer, you know, the operating systems are no longer being supported by, you know, Windows and things like that. So, you know, there are vulnerabilities there. Um, you've got other things um, like crew dynamics. So some ships, the crews change semi-regularly. Other ones keep the same crew for quite a long time. Mm. But the problem is if you've got these quite complex systems being put on board ships now, as crew come and go, they may not necessarily have the knowledge about those systems that they're actually working with. 
um, you know, you can quite imagine there's quite traditional ships still out there with very limited technology. You put one of those crew members on one of these new ships that have got all the bells and whistles, they may not fully understand what their actions, the implications of their actions that they have with the systems that they're using. Um, and this goes for the idea of how to maintain those systems as well is you know quite often it used to be the ship's engineer that was in charge of everything on board the ship mechanical and electrical and they had to deal with it and you know they could do running repairs on the go if not when they came into port they could organize and arrange for outside support to come on and help whereas nowadays these technology technological systems they're very very complex and you know you kind of have to have a phd to understand some of them mm -hmm. and how they work so actually a lot of the sort of this maintenance and support side is now happening from outside. So, okay. you know, there is this sort of de-skilling of some of those crew on board in that sense, but actually they're requiring this outside assistance. So that instantly means you need more communication and more access for a remote operator to come on and have a look at these systems and potentially be able to work out what the problem is. You know, it's not always pushing and holding the power button isn't always going to solve the problems, mm. you know, that you face. Um, so there are other issues. I mean, silly things um, like a lot of the um, technology, land-based infrastructure and technology that is used to communicate with ships, that's all privately owned. And because it's land-based as well, it means the International Maritime Organization doesn't necessarily have the strongest position to be able to cre create regulation that covers those systems mm -hmm. um, because they're within the sovereign area of a the state. Therefore, they are the state's right to govern them. So the IMO itself can only put out guidance. So these systems are only as secure as the, as the, the state wants them to be or requires them to be. Mm -hmm. um, so you can quite imagine that there's a bit of discrepancy between, say, what the US and the UK do to a smaller country, sort of one of the smaller African countries. You know, it could be a very dis different sort of policy regulation landscape um, for security there. Mm -hmm. um, but also we need to remember that cybersecurity is also just one of the challenges that the maritime industry face. Um, I mean, it raised its head in 2014 was the first time it was discussed at the International Maritime Organization. Um, and that was because there was a, a set of attacks on a set of oil rigs um, that raised concerns. Actually, this might be something we need to think about. And since then, it's been discussed, but it's not been the primary focus of the IMO. Um, you know, things like the sulfur cap, uh, which is about looking at uh, emissions uh, from burning the fuel on board. Um, alternative fuels, that's another thing, um, mass migration, you know, there's a lot of other issues that the International Maritime Organization has to focus on. So with cybersecurity, it seems like it's been put on the back burner at the moment. Okay. You know, because other issues are much more important or seem to be much more important at the moment. Um, so, you know, it's a slow process in that sense to get regulation created. Uh, for the maritime so is there any regulation at the moment is there any type of like minimum standard um say for example in the uk does the uk um have these sort of requirements of ships of newly built ships that they must adhere to a certain standard of cyber security um yes and no um so i'll start at the international level and i'll try and work backwards from there because it's the easiest way of doing it so at the international level through the imo they have got a set of guidelines, cybersecurity guidelines of what should, you know, things that should be done, recommendations like strong passwords, um, access control, um, firewalls, things like that. So there's, you know, a good broad range of recommendations there. Within the regulation, um, there was a resolution put out in 2017 that basically said that all ships and operators should have a cyber risk management approach within their normal safety risk management processes of the vessel so this basically means that they uh, ships should have risk assessments um, and mitigation measures to ensure that if a cyber incident or a cyber attack was to occur that the ship wasn't an wasn't unsafe so that you know it wasn't endangered to the crew or the other other people around the ship 
Mm. Um, so that's kind of a should, um, which in legal terms is kind of recommendations. It's not a will or they must, it's a should. Mm -hmm. um, but there has been good uptake by the industry um, to actually put these into practices. Um, so then you look at sort of a more regional level. So the European Union, for instance, they have the NIST directive, um, which basically outlines um, the security of networks and information systems um, at sort of a critical national infrastructure level. Um, and this one, so most countries agree that, well, I think all countries agree that ports are critical infrastructure, so they fall under the guidance of NIST, which means they have to have some form of cybersecurity um, in place. Um, but then some countries have also gone as far and said that ships are also seen as critical infrastructure or essential services. Mm -hmm. So they're also included under the guise of NIST. Um, countries like Denmark, I know they've also um, sort of said that um, companies like Maersk, say, who are based in Denmark, are, could actually be also seen as an essential service because of, you know, their impact on the, econ on the Danish economy if something happened to them. So again, you know, there's different ways of it being applied. Coming down to sort of the national level, um, the UK, like many in Europe, have obviously uh, ratified the NIST directive. So they follow the NIST directive to the letter. Um, but they have also, they have also included that the reason to include the risk assessment, the cyber risk assessments, as said by the International Maritime Organization, um, that's also included in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, directives themselves. Um, there's also other work being done by um, the classification societies um, mm -hmm. within the industry. So if a ship wishes to sail, it has to be within a class and it has to have a certificate to say that it meets the requirements of that class. Mm -hmm. And that allows it to sail, to have insurance, to be chartered, etc. So it's a very important piece of documentation a ship has to have. And um, most of the large classification societies are now including um, cyber secure, cyber essentials. There's lots of different names for them, but they're all including some form of cyber security or cyber awareness mm -hmm. within the compliance documentation now, mm -hmm. um, you know, which has a positive impact in the sense that a lot of ships, if they're thinking about cybersecurity, they can now have this extra little notation on their certificate to say they are cyber secure, which makes people feel better when they, you know, employing them or uh, for insurance purposes because they're at less risk of cyber insurance. So there's sort of different incentives all the way through from an international to a national level of how cybersecurity is starting to be introduced and thought about properly by the industry. So let me ask you, who would benefit from a, like carrying out a cyber attack on a, on a ship or on a line of ships so there's two schools of thought with this one um so and there's cases for both so one would be a state level incident and the others would be a sort of criminal based um element so with state level so it's a state level they tend not to there seems to be a lack of actually attacking large parts of the maritime industry because actually if you disrupt the trade in one place it's likely to have a knock-on effect mm -hmm. on your trade as well 90 percent of the world's goods are transported by sea so you can see how it might be unattractive to you know wipe out large parts of maritime infrastructure because it would have a knock-on effect um but there was a case um last year when the during the oh issues in the strait of Hamas that the US um, put out a broadcast to say that they believed that ships in the area were having their uh, GPS uh, location manipulated um, mm -hmm. by Iran because they were trying to, and I, their words were effectively, trick ships into entering territorial waters so they could then be seized. Mm -hmm. So limit, you know, sort of a limited look at it of what a cyber attack could do for a state, but that's just one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Russia have also been accused of spoofing GPS signals around certain locations around the Crimea and around um, a supposed holiday home for Putin um, so that GPS tracking missiles can't 
target them. But obviously that has a knock on effect on navigation of ships in the area as well. Uh, they were some of the ships were being reported that they were at the airport rather it was 25 kilometers away from where they actually were rather than the port. So, you know, interesting knock on effects. Um, but it seems to be that the criminal element is the one that's the most interested with sort of in as uh, sort of attacking cyber systems within the maritime. Um, I mean, dating back, you've got the Port of Antwerp attack, uh, where hackers were spoofing, uh, sorry, they, sorry, not spoofing, they were managed to gain access to the cargo logs and the tracking within the Port of Antwerp for containers, which allowed them then to divert containers that contained uh, drugs and be able to pick them up um, without them going through customs, etc. So they were able to smuggle through. Um, and they believe, you know, they, there is belief that it did have quite a, it could have had quite a significant impact. Um, but then you've got other instances. So um, the ports of San Diego, um, Barcelona were hit by cyber attacks. They went, they were looking at more the enterprise systems. So sort of the financial business sensitive side of the ports mm -hmm. um, where there could be money to be made by ransoming off this information or selling Sort of trade you know not trade secrets but commercial secrets off to other other buyers so there's that side of it um i mean the interesting one i think though is that you might not be able to necessarily classify it between state level and criminal level um because if you take the Maersk incident from 2017 so that was believed obviously believed to be a state level attack on um the Ukrainian tax base uh, tax system that they file their taxes on, and it spread from those systems into the Maersk systems, and then spread from Maersk onto others like TNT and other industries. Mm. Um, now that attack wasn't directly targeting a shipping company, wasn't necessarily criminally based, but it had a huge, huge impact on the maritime industry in general. It shut down terminals. It meant Maersk ships couldn't sail into port to unload because they didn't know what goods were on. It took them effectively months to be able to get up and running back to normal. So it's not necessarily an attack on the maritime itself, but could have an impact on the maritime. Okay. Sense as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's so interconnected. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, you hear people talk about supply chain security and, um, you know, in, in the maritime industry, that is very much the case is, you know, you've got containers that are being driven or taken by train from factory to the port, loaded onto a boat, and then it's put onto another train at another port, you know, so, you know, there's so much interconnection in the trade now um, that actually, you, you know, an attack might not necessarily originate just from within the maritime. So, so after the Maersk incident, did other shipping lines or other sh shipping companies, have they become more sensitive to the, the fragilities of their cybersecurity? And does that in turn make somebody like you who researches this stuff, um, does that make you an asset to them so that you can sort of, you know, work with them at some point? Yeah. Um, so, since when it was first, when cybersecurity was first raised at the IMO, I say back in 2014, it was a very much of something might happen. Mm. Um, there was no real, there, there was some examples, but there weren't really big examples, you know, things that make people stop and listen. Mm -hmm. um, and Musk was kind of that catalyst that they actually went, well, hang on, the largest shipping company in the world just has been hit by this cyber attack. You know, that in what was that impact of that attack? Oh, it wasn't an attack on them, but what was an impact of that incident? And actually, companies, a lot of companies have gone, well, actually, if that kind of hit us, we might not have been in as good a position as Maersk were to deal with this. You know, Maersk are a multi-billion dollar company. They have a dedicated cybersecurity team. You know, they have a lot of money to throw at problems, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of other shipping companies, I'm thinking, say, the Greek family owned shipping companies that might own one ship or two ships, you know, who are totally reliant on those being operational when they need them. They haven't got the ability or the money to throw at problems like this. 
So actually for to see Maersk being hit by it does make them stop and think, well, actually, what can we do to ensure that if something happened like that, obviously not on that scale, but it wouldn't mean that our ship can't move for two weeks or whatever. You know, it, it allow, you know, it opens the eyes of the industry to actually start thinking about it. Um, and I mean, companies, so there's um, a shipping and association like BIMCO, um, who work with a lot of other members and stakeholders in the maritime industry. And they produce um, a new set of their guidelines for onboard ship security each year, um, or it's near enough each year. And they, you know, they work with the actual ship operators and the um, owners and operators to work out what threats they face, what risks they've had to mitigate, what maybe what attacks they've seen, and start putting that guidance back out into the industry. Um, and you know, it's work that I'm doing and things like that that can help. You know, there's other people in the industry uh, doing this. There's other people in academia that are looking much more technical than myself, who looks at regulation and policy. But there's a lot of work that still needs to be done for the future. Mm. Um, when, you know, Maersk by no means was a silver bullet that everybody's now thinking about cybersecurity. It was a start. You know, it started to make people think. But there needs to be more being done. Mm -hmm. You know, the future is autonomous ships, whether that's going to happen in five years' times or in 25 years' time. It's going to happen at some point. And at some point, that means technology is going to be the thing that's running the ships completely. Mm -hmm. So something needs to be done. You know, more focus needs to be looked at with cybersecurity now for that future. So with regards to your work, uh, you mentioned there's, there's others that are more technical. What are you, is your focus purely on regulation or do you sort of look at um, the, the technical side too? Um, so as part of my um, work with the CDT, um, I was given, we're, we're all given six months effectively for myself, technical training and for the technical people they get sort of more social training as well. Um, so it means I do understand systems, I understand how they work, network security, computer security, I understand those as well. So mm -hmm. I can approach this from sort of an interdisciplinary approach where mm -hmm. I can look from the political side as well as the technical side. Um, but my main focus is within policy and governance. Um, but that said, so the International Association of Classification Societies, who I spoke about earlier, the Classification Society, they're members of what's called IACS. Um, so this organization, IAX, they have basically produced a set of what they call cyber steps, cyber recommendations, um, which are 12 sets of technical mm -hmm. guidance, technical governance, effectively, of what things owners and operators should be doing on, on board to protect their system. So documents like that, I can pick up and understand from both the technical side as well as a mm -hmm. policy side. Yeah. And you know, it's that kind of work where there needs to be a merging of the regulation and the technical. Maritime isn't unique in this sense. You know, a lot of industries are facing this where there has been an increased pressure to put cybersecurity measures in place. You know, aviation has been one, um, electric, uh, you know, gas, electric, nuclear, water systems, all of these have all had this, this challenge of how do you take, how do you put technical solutions in place that meet regulation and how does regulation match what you've put in? You know, it's this two way relationship um, mm -hmm. to try and understand what's appropriate, what's needed, what's not needed, what's appropriate and what you actually need to mandate maybe to force people to have. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me about you. So far, you, you, you've obviously you've um, come into the end of your um, time, or perhaps just your PhD at the CDT at Royal Holloway. Um, tell me, how has that experience been for you? What, what were what were sort of the the key um, benefits to you from there? So, the CDT is a fantastic thing from my perspective. It has allowed me to do so much more with my research than I would have necessarily been able to do with a traditional funded PhD route. Um, so a lot of that has been about the opportunity to go and travel to conferences, to meetings, to go and actually meet key stakeholders and major players in the industry that on a, maybe on a normal PhD route, I wouldn't have been able to go out and meet them. 
I would have had to maybe do, you know, emails or like Skype conversations, which wouldn't necessarily have added the depth and the quality of research that I've managed to get because I've gone out and met these people. Um, as part of my um, PhD, I've also been able to do a couple of internships, um, which has allowed me to spend a long period of time immersed within the industry. Mm. Um, but again, has added, you know, not just an outsider looking in view. I have that sort of insider working within the industry, trying to understand the industry from the inside and understanding how, you know, the patterns of work, the behaviours and all of that that allows then my research to be able to target and be written in a way that somebody safe from one of these companies or associations can pick up and maybe learn something from, mm. you know, it's not sort of this theoretical high level, I'm looking down on everybody else out yeah. there. This is what I foresee. You know, mm. this is me working within the industry to say, actually, you know, this is what looking at what's happening. This is what I think needs to happen, should happen, might want to happen. And mm. um, without the CDT being able to fund my, visits and things like that I'd never have been able to have the interaction and the engagement that I have um how, how important do you think something like you know these these experiences are for getting um involved in the industry so early on into your PhD how do you think how important do you think they are in helping you sort of shape your research I they uh, you know desperately needed it's something that I you know looking at a lot of research you too when you do a PhD you end up reading so much other research it's unreal but looking at a lot of research out there there is so much that sort of this theoretical kind of you can tell they've never not really spoken to anybody in the field you know the field that they're researching and says they've not gone to industry and said oh if we started doing this what would that mean oh let's put this technical solution in it will be fine they don't have that you mm -hmm. know they don't have the ability to go and talk to somebody and actually say you know looking at industry doing this probably would have limited effect it might look good but it would have limited effect mm -hmm. and without that you know research just wouldn't be you know practical is probably the wrong word but you know somebody wouldn't can't necessarily pick up another PhD and go oh I can learn all about what I need to do here from that PhD because it's written in that sort of high level of way mm -hmm. whereas you know I'm hoping mine comes across when it's finally written uh, finally finished that actually it's something that people can pick up and go, well, actually, yeah, he understands how industry works. You know, he's, he's spoken with industry. That's clear. He sees that actually doing stuff this way wouldn't work, but this way might work. You know, that's the kind of element that I really want from my PhD. Mm -hmm. um, but also being able to go out and talk to people doing these internships, you know, when potential employers are looking for people, you know, PhD students, especially one like myself, I've only done a few years actually out in the real world, I say, you know, out working because I, you know, I did my undergrad, a few years of work, then did my master's straight into my PhD. I haven't got the work experience necessarily that some companies are looking for. But because I've had this op the opportunities raised by the CDT to go out and engage in long term sort of placements and things with industry, I now have that experience that actually is a benefit to potential employees. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that is one of the good things about the CDT is that you're able to get that experience. They support you the whole way through it. And at the end of it, you know, it makes us stand apart from potentially apart from other PhD routes and things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the information security group at Royal Holloway already has quite a good, you know, a good reputation in the security, you know, cybersecurity world. Um, you know, and with the CDT as part of that, it's a strong basis, you know, for employees to look at and go, ah, oh, they've come from Holloway. You know, mm -hmm. that means something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I want to ask you, so now that you sort of you're coming towards the end of your, your PhD, you're doing your write up. What, what, what are your next steps or what, what do you want your next steps to be? So the next steps for me is finding a job. Um, and actually getting out into the real world and being able to put what I've learned into use. Mm -hmm. um, I know it sounds corny and cheesy, but, you know, childhood dream of I always wanted to make a difference, mm. it, you know, that kind of thing. So to be able to work with um, the International Maritime Organization, work with the governments, to be able to help guide policy, um, help you know, change regulation for the better, you know, that's the kind of work 
that I want to do. And that's the, that's the direction I want to take in the long run. It's just finding, um, you know, it's finding the right job that allows me to do that. Mm-hmm. And so can I ask, what was your undergraduate in? So my undergraduate studies was in um, geography and global politics. Okay. So mine was, it was a combined honours, but the two subjects were taught completely independently of, mm-hmm. of each other. So I have geography and I had politics, very separate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I uh, did my master's at Royal Holloway, which was in geopolitics and security, which mashed my two parts of my degree okay. very nicely together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that obviously led into um, my... A PhD which is a geopol- geopolitics ge- to PhD as well so so what, what advice would you give somebody who's like yourself has this um sort of uh social sciences background uh and who wants to get into something like information security or or like cyber security and obviously I'm imagining even for you it was quite a daunting experience to s- sort of transcend um, so what advice would you give to somebody who's who's considering that but is a bit you know reluctant don't be put off by thinking that people are smarter than you in the room with cybersecurity. um as part of the cdt you're putting we're in cohorts of about 10 students and i'm sitting in the room with some of the people that are writing cryptography standards um i've got some exceptionally brilliant mathematicians that I can't understand the first number they put on the board. You know, I'm amongst some very, very daunting people for me as a social scientist. What could I, you know, the question I ask is what could I offer here at this point to these people that are, you know, look fantastic. I can offer a lot to them as any, as they can offer a lot to my research. Part of the CD, the charms of the CDT is that you don't go through your PhD in isolation. You are not one student on your own trying to fight through this. You're a group. You, the idea is we have this community spirit within the CDT. So we've got 40, 50 students and the ones that have left, you know, there's another 20, 30 that have left. You know, all these still keep in contact with the CDT. So we all talk to each other. We all work with each other. So if I've got a question about malware, I know there's probably five or six people that I can quickly drop an email or bump into in the corridor and ask them, and get a simple enough response that I can understand it. And they know if there's a question about, oh, I'm not quite sure what this regulation is saying or what this policy is meant to be doing. You know, what do you think it is? I can answer those questions as well. So don't ever be put off by the fact is, oh, I'm a social scientist in a technical world. There's as much need for that social view as there is of the technical view. Mm -hmm. Because whatever way you look at it, the technical solutions are only one part of the problem you know one part of the problem one part of the solution the social side is also the other part a very important part there's you know you can have fantastic firewalls um fantastic access control um policies but if you don't understand how that fits with your company how that works you know with compliance it means nothing Mm-hmm. You know, so for a social scientist coming into a technical field you they, you know you're as much of an asset as you are a technical solution as well. that, absolutely that's fantastic advice uh, that is fantastic advice and i couldn't have said it about it myself um are you on twitter by any chance i am indeed um, uh, so my twitter handle is just at rory hotcraft mm-hmm. uh, nice and simple one <laughs> we'll link it onto the onto the page anyway um I say, you know, if anybody else is interested in research, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy, you know, to have a conversation, have a chat. Um, I can also send some of the articles um, that I've published as well if they're of interest to people. Yeah, if if you can, yeah, what, what I'll do is I'll also link them on onto the video as well so that people can have instant access to them. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Excellent. Well, Rory, it's been a, a pleasure speaking to you. I, I've really enjoyed it and, and it's really opened up sort of my eyes to the world of maritime. So uh, thank you. No, thank you for having me. It's been it's been great to have a chat and it's yeah, it's a subject I'm passionate about and it's you know it's nice to see you know get other people passionate about it as well. Absolutely.